you ever made a scene? I mean, you really made a scene. You were walking in the school cafeteria and you tripped and your food went flying everywhere. People start clapping and cheering. You're like, oh gosh. You're sitting in French class and, and it's really quiet and all of a sudden you rip the loudest fart. It smells up the whole room. You're like, no, how did I do that? That lunch food, it got you again. Or maybe my favorite one, you're taking a drink of soda and somebody makes you laugh and it squirts out your nasal passages and then you're laughing so hard you pee yourself. I know that you've made a scene. I know I'm not the only one that's done all three of those, just not at the same time. But tonight I wanna tell you this, a story about when I made a scene in the sixth grade. In the sixth grade, I lived in South Florida with my mom, my dad, and my little sister, and we get this great idea that we're gonna decorate the house for Christmas. Now in Florida, in December, it's like 5,000 degrees. It doesn't feel like Christmas, so Jessica and I are like, we're, we're gonna make a tropical winter wonderland. Now the inside of the house was easy. We'd done that before. Hang up a couple ornaments here and there on the tree, you set out the nativity scene, you do the thing, but the outside, yeah, no one had let us do that before, and there's probably a good reason. Well, Jessica and I, we find every single strand of Christmas lights in all of the garage. We pull them all out, and we start taking them and, and wrapping them around the palm trees. We wrap them on the bushes. We put them on the mailbox, and I felt like such a boss, y'all, because I was going to plug this in, and I was going to light up the night. I had figured out how to get all of these strands hooked together into one cord, and I'm just going to plug it in, and it's going to be epic. Except I didn't realize when I went to plug in the cord, using this end, obviously, when I went to plug in the cord, I'm standing in a puddle of water barefoot. You, some of you, like four of you, know what's about to happen, right? <laughs> Like, and then I reach over and I do what you're not supposed to do. I grab Jessica's arm and now she's got the power and we're shaking and the neighbors are like, what are those girls doing? This is what I looked like. You guys, this is for real. Like I was absolutely, this is what I looked like. Ah! You guys, by God's grace, I was able to let go. And at that very moment, my sister and I were crying and we're sobbing and I'm like, I'm so sorry. We're apologizing for a lifetime of sins. Like, I'm so sorry, I flushed your Barbies. Please forgive me. And then Jessica's like, should we tell mom and dad we almost killed ourselves? I'm like, no, they'll kill us for sure. Like, we cannot do that. You guys, it was such an epic scene. Tonight in our Bible, do you guys have Bibles with you tonight? Do you have little journals, like mixed journals you're writing in? If you have those, pop those out. Tonight, we're going to be jumping into a scene in God's word that is a scene. Nobody gets electrocuted, you know, spoiler alert. But this scene in 1 Kings chapter 18, it, is, it, it has blood, it has battles, it has fire, it has swords, it has sarcasm. It has all the makings of a viral YouTube video right in this scene we're going to dive into in 1 Kings chapter 18. Are you ready? Here we go. So Elijah's our boy. Elijah's the prophet of God. His name actually means the Lord is my God. That's what it means in the Hebrew. If my name, Jacqueline, was translated into the Hebrew, it would probably mean girl who stands in puddle barefoot, right? Or not smart. I don't know what it really means, but, but his name means the Lord is my God. God shoulder taps Elijah and he says, I want you to go tell King Ahab a message that I'm about to make it rain. Not this kind of make it rain, but this kind of make it rain because there's been a drought in the land. For three and a half years, God's people have been without water. You guys, that's longer than you're in middle school. That is a long time without water and the people of God were struggling. So Elijah, he goes up to King Ahab and as soon as King Ahab sees him, the trash talking starts. He's like, aha, it's you, Elijah, you troublemaker of Israel. Elijah, in God's power, he's like, oh, no, bro, that is you. You are the one that's led God's people astray. You are the one that's led them to follow Baal, the storm God. That's you. That's on you. And he says, we're going to settle this once and for all. I want you to get all of the people and meet me on Mount Carmel. I want you to get 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah, and I want you to meet me on this mountain, and we're going to settle this. 
Now, if, if Elijah was in junior high, he might say something like, meet me behind the playground at four o'clock. It's about to go down. Like, we're going to settle this once and for all. Now, I think I lost half of you because you're thinking about, is there really a mountain made of caramel? Like, where do I find this mountain made of caramel? Because I love caramel. Anybody out there love caramel? They, you are my people. You are my people. I am really sad to tell you there's no mountain of caramel. But check out this mountain. This is the mountain of Mount Carmel. It's in Israel. My husband has actually been there. He says it's really, really flat. Boom, mountain. And then really, really flat again. You guys, God has asked Elijah to bring everybody up to the mountain for this epic showdown. It's going to go down on this mountain. And if you happen to have a bellyache and couldn't make it that night, if you lived in Israel, you probably could see what was going to go down on this mountain, on Mount Carmel. So here's what happened. Elijah went before the people. Verse 21 says this. How long, Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord's God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. You guys, the people said nothing. You guys, this is the storm God. When I think of a storm, I think of rain, I think of wind, I think of lightning and thunder. You guys, Baal has bailed on them. There has been no rain for three and a half years, and the people are still on the fence. The people are God like, I don't know. They literally say nothing. Elijah's asking them to choose, and they are on the fence. That's a funny phrase, on the fence. Like, have you ever thought about that? Who really sits on a fence? Check this picture out. I saw a sign once, and this picture is of a fence. Like, who would ever say this? Do not sit on the fence. Yes, and someone says, ouch. Why would you do that? On the fence literally means you are undecided. You can't figure out which way to go. It's, if you think of a property line, a fence is, is a property line, right? So I have a backyard and then I have a fence and then I have Mr. Leslie's property on the other side. If I'm sitting on that fence, I'm really not on anybody's property. I haven't committed. And that's what God's people are doing in our story. Michael Jordan is one of the best basketball players of all time. Some of you would say Kobe, some of you would say everybody else, but Michael Jordan's up there. I think we can all agree on that. Here's my boy MJ right here. So Michael Jordan, I found out last week, he almost, he almost signed with Adidas. Did you know that? He actually wanted to go with Adidas, but they didn't show him the money, and so he went with Nike. Now, I've heard this story. He wrote in his book called Driven Within It From Within. Michael Jordan says this. He says, he was going over to his friend's house. His friend's name is Fred Whitfield. Now, I've never heard of Fred, but apparently he was an NBA owner, like he was a president of an NBA team. He goes over to his house, and it's kind of cold outside, and Michael Jordan's like, hey, can I borrow one of your jackets? Would that be cool? And he's like, yeah, man, just go grab one out of the closet. So he goes, and Michael Jordan disappears, and he comes back out like 10 minutes later with an armload of athletic gear. He's got clothes, sneakers, shoes. He's got all kinds of like just everything you can imagine, athletic gear, and he drops it right in front of Fred. Fred's looking at him like, what? You just needed a jacket. What are you doing? Then he walks back and he goes and he gets another armload of stuff. And at this point, Fred's getting nervous. He's like, what is he doing with all of these clothes? He looked at the clothes and he realizes that they all have the same label on it. They were all Puma. And at the time, Puma was a rival of Nike. So at that point, he comes back out with another armload, he throws it down, and then it gets weird. Michael Jordan goes into the kitchen, and he comes back out with a butcher knife. True story. True story. Who does this? I don't have a butcher knife because that would be psycho, but I do have scissors. He literally takes the perfectly good Puma gear, and he just starts chopping it into a million pieces. Eh, maybe I should have used a butcher knife. It's not working. But he cuts it up into a million pieces. And then he scoops it all up and he takes it and he throws away all of his friend's clothes. And then he comes back in and he says, Fred, you can call my Nike rep and he'll replace all of that stuff for you. But dude, I never want to see you with any Puma gear ever again. You got to get off the fence. I mean, who does that? Who 
can do that and still have friends. I have no idea. Please don't try this at home, right? Your parents are going to call me and email me and text me. Do not chop up your friend's clothes. But Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan, he was on to something when it comes to idols. And most of you guys go to Southeast and you know Pastor Kyle Eidelman. And he said this, check out this quote. This is so good. He says, Michael Jordan's behavior is a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. But don't you think that Jordan offers us a pretty good picture of idol smashing? He's demonstrating total commitment. And really, that's the kind of commitment God wants from his people. He doesn't just want us to make room in our closet for him. He wants the closet to himself. You guys, the people of Israel, they were on the fence. They couldn't make up the mi their minds. And right in this moment, Elijah's calling them to choose. You got to decide, is it God or is it Baal? So Elijah sets up the ground rules for the showdown at sundown. All right, so I have some, I'm going to make, uh, you're going to love this. So he has one right here. He says, all right, here's how the rules are going to be. He says, you're going to make prophets of Baal. You're going to make right here an altar to your God, to Baal. You're going to make your little altar, do whatever you do to your sacrifice. He's like, here's a bull. This is my child. Sorry, Adele. And then he says, I'm going to do the same thing over here. I'm going to make an altar to the Lord. I'm going to get wood. I'm going to get a sacrifice. I'm going to set it all up, but we're not going to strike the match. You're not allowed to light the match. Get it all ready, but don't light the match. And I'll do the same thing. And then we're going to take turns calling down fire from heaven. We're going to call on our God. And the God who answers by fire, he is the Lord. Now, if I am in the audience, I'm thinking, this is going to be awesome. Like, I want to have enough battery life in my phone to get this because this is going to go viral. We're going to have a fireworks show, and I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm super pumped to see. And so the prophets of Baal, they get to work. They get their little, I'm so sorry, they get their little bowl, they get it all ready, and then they start doing their thing. They start dancing and chanting and doing the hokey pokey and turning themselves around, all their religious whatever, and they call out, Baal, answer us. Baal, answer us. Baal, answer us. Guess what? <laughs> Baal doesn't answer. Yeah, he doesn't send the rain. Baal can't send the fire. He has no power. And check out this verse. At verse 27, Elijah's getting a little bored. He's like, okay, guys, we've been doing this for hours. I've literally, we are wasting our time at this point. What are you doing? At noon, Elijah begins to taunt them. The inner junior hire <laughs> comes out of Elijah. This is my favorite part. Elijah begins to taunt them, and he shouts, shout louder. Surely he's a god. Perhaps he's deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's in Destin on summer break. Maybe he's sleeping and you just need to wake him up. You guys, his spiritual gift is prophecy, and yet he has a spiritual gift of sarcasm. And I'm like, I love this guy. You are my favorite prophet. Verse 28, it gets, it gets dark pretty fast. They shout louder, the prophets of Baal, and they slash themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Another version of the Bible says, until their blood gushed. And at that point, I'm like, oh, I'm out, or I'm going to pass out. Midday passed, and they continue their prophesying until the evening sacrifice, but there was no response, no one answered, and no one paid attention. Some of you guys can relate. Some of you, you lay your heads on the pillow at night and you lay down and you feel like the prophets of Baal, like no one responded, no one answered, and no one even paid attention. You were ghosted on text. You were silenced on social media. Once again, you weren't invited and you're laying there thinking, what on earth is this all about? Or maybe you finally were invited and you finally did get invited to do that thing or you made the grade or you made the team and yet you still feel empty and hollow inside. Let me tell you this, you guys, and don't miss this. When we put our hope and our faith and our trust in anything other than Jesus, you guys, that's how the day ends. Like the prophets of Baal who have cried out for so long and yet it doesn't satisfy you guys, because they don't. These idols in our life, they don't have the power to fill us. They just don't satisfy. These are my three kids. They're not here tonight, but I wanted to show you a picture of them. This is Mason. He's my oldest. And this is Adele. She's my sweet little girl. Can you guys see this? And this is John Mark, my little guy. 
Well, the other day, Adele, she came up to me. She had big tears in her eyes, thinking, oh, gosh, what happened? What did Mason do to you, Adele? You know, my sweet little girl. And she's about to cry. And she says, Mommy, I think I have an idol in my life. I was like, oh, wow, really? Well, well, who is it? She goes, well, guess who? I said, well, I don't know. Is that cute boy that sits at your table or maybe the girl that's really popular in your class? And she's like, no, Mom, no, guess who the board game and I'm like, for real? This is the idol in your life? I've tried really hard not to just laugh in her face because that's like not the mom thing to do. And she says, I said, why would you think this is an idol? And she goes, because I just love it so much. <laughs> sweet Adele, sweet Adele. And then I start thinking, who has taught her about idols? Like, do I need to fire a Sunday school teacher? Like somebody messed up because she's so confused about this whole thing. And we talk about it and I hopefully straighten everything out. And then I remember, oh yeah, she remembers the conversation I have with Mason. See, my son Mason might be like one of your brothers or sisters. Whenever Mason gets in the car after school, this is what he sounds like. Hey mom, I was just wondering um, if we could go straight home after school so I could play my Xbox. I love my Xbox. Mom, do you think that we could go straight home, not to the grocery store, not to anywhere else? No errands, please mom. I just really wanna get home to play my Xbox because my friend Luca's gonna get on at 4.30 and I was just wondering, I've already done my reading and you know it takes like 20 minutes of reading before I'm allowed to play my Xbox? I've already done that this morning. Do you think we can go home and play my Xbox? Please mom, huh, huh, huh? Ah! You guys, as a mom, I'm like, oh my gosh, make it stop too many words. So instead of like, you know, over and over and over again, finally, I'm like, Mason, 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 do you know what an idol is? He's like, yeah, mom, yeah, it's the little cats at the Chinese restaurants, the little porcelain cats that look like this. I'm like, well, maybe. And he goes, no, okay, it's the little, it's the golden calf. Yeah, that's an idol. Didn't the Israelites bow down to that or something? I was like, yeah, they did. I said, but Mason, an idol is really anything in your life that you put above the Lord. Anything that you put in God's spot in your life, that is an idol. Anything that you're putting all of your, your faith and your trust in and your energy goes towards that thing and that thing alone. Mason's like, oh, I know what the idols are in your life. I was like, wait a second, bro. Like, I'm the one that's supposed to be doing this. He does this, like, Jedi mind trick, and all of a sudden, I'm in the hot seat. And then I'm thinking, I don't really know what he wants, what he's going to tell me, and I'm kind of scared, but I kind of want to find out. So I'm like, all right, what do you think it is? Coffee, mom. It's totally coffee. You're addicted to Starbucks. You can't live a day without it. You've got to be honest. I'm right, mom. I was like, okay, well, what else you got? He goes, your phone. You love your phone. You're always on your phone. It's always just one minute, just one minute. I'm almost done. He's like, you're always doing email or text or something. You're totally addicted to your phone. Your phone's an idol, mom. I said, okay, you might be right. There might be times that those creep into idol status, but Mace, what about you? <laughs> it's my turn. And he's like, um, looks down at the floorboard of the car and you can tell he's not wanting to say this out loud and he kind of mumbles, it's totally my Xbox. This is Mason in his natural habitat playing his Xbox all the time. This is just like he would live in this state right here. Yes, he's a KU fan. I don't know why or how it's supposed to be UK or something, but he, he's just totally zoned out. And Mason just says this, he's only nine and I was so proud of him for actually admitting this out loud. He said, mommy, the thing is when I, he still calls me mommy, isn't that awesome? He says, mommy, the thing is when I get off my Xbox, I just really want to play more. I just doesn't really make me happy. I just really want to play more of it. And I said, Mace, here's the thing. Idols don't satisfy. They just don't. It's not what they do. They don't have that kind of power to fill us. God's people were on the fence. You guys, tonight, we got to get honest about the idols that are in our life. What about you? If you were in that car riding with Mason and I, and all of a sudden you're in the hot seat, what are the idols in your life that are battling for your heart, that are battling to be in God's spot? I don't know what it is. Maybe it's popularity. Maybe it's acceptance or sports or friends. You guys, it doesn't necessarily have to be a sin. Sometimes good things creep into that spot that really belongs to the Lord. So back to our story Elijah's turn is now, and Elijah, he gets his, his uh, altar ready. He gets the wood ready. He takes out 12 stones, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. He sets the stones out. He gets the wood right. He gets his little bowl. Isn't that sad? Look at his eyes. 
I mean, can you, I can't even look. So he, Elijah, he's an Oklahoma Sooner fan, so he puts it horns down because some of you will get that. He puts it horns down, he prepares it, but then Elijah does something weird. Not a normal sacrifice thing. He starts digging a trench around the sacrifice all the way around. And then he calls and he says, guys, I need 12 jars of water. He gets these huge vats of water. Remember, they're in a drought. I can just imagine there's a dude in the back that's like, don't pour the water. I need a bath. I smell. He just takes it and he just wastefully pours this water over the sacrifice. He takes it and he starts spraying it down really good. And I'm no Girl Scout, but do you know what? Wet wood, it does not burn. Have you tried this? If you're going to make a bonfire and the wood is wet, you guys, it doesn't work. It like smokes, but it really doesn't catch on fire. Why is Elijah doing this? Elijah is setting the stage for the Lord to do an even greater miracle. Some of you out there, you're doubters, you're skeptics. And I bet you there were some of those people out there in the middle of that crowd and they're thinking, oh, if fire really does fall from heaven, it's probably an optical illusion or well-timed lightning. You guys, when Elijah pours all that water down and it fills the trenches around the, the altar, He's setting the stage for an even greater miracle. All right, so let's read. Elijah, he does all that, and then he prays. Verse 36, if you're following along, Elijah prays, and he says, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God and that I'm your servant. I've done all these things at your command. I'm not going rogue here, Lord. I'm just doing what you told me to do and preparing this and setting this up. And then verse 37, he says, answer me, Lord, answer me. So these people will know that you are God and that you're turning their hearts back again. You guys, Elijah prays 63 words. It takes like 30 seconds. Some of you are like, oh, if my youth pastor would only pray for 30 seconds, that would be awesome. His prayer was so short and yet tucked in the middle of that prayer, you guys, is the reason for the showdown. God is trying to battle for the hearts of his people back. He's trying to call his people back. It's not so he can just say, ah, prophets of Baal, you stink, you're stupid, you have no power, look at me, I'm so strong, I'm flexing my muscles, I'm God, you're not. No, he's trying to win back the hearts of his people. Check out what happens. Verse 38, the fire of the Lord falls. It burns up the sacrifice. Bye-bye. Oh, Sorry about that. It burns up the wood. It burns up the stones, everything, and even licks up the, uh, the water inside the trench. You guys, this is not normal fire. When the people saw this, they fell on their face and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. You guys, the fire, this was not normal fire. The fire of the Lord, it came down and it burned everything. It makes me wonder, did the people in the front row like lose their eyebrows? Like was the fire so hot? It just burns up everything. But you guys, what happens in that moment when the fire falls, the people had a face moment. Do you know in the Bible when people fall on their face? They fall on their face as a sign of like, God, you're God and I'm not. They fall on their face. It's a sign of reverence. It's a sign of, I'm sorry, Lord. It's a sign of repentance. They fall on their face. The fire moment led to a face moment, and then it leads to a faith moment where they say, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. You guys, tonight in this place, God's calling us to get off the fence and to make a decision for him. You guys, you have a choice. Are you going to follow the ways of this world? Are you going to follow Baal who cannot deliver what he promises? Or are you going to follow the Lord Jesus and his plans and his ways for your life? That's what we're calling you to tonight is to get off the fence. And then we're calling you to get really honest and say, you know what? If I'm really honest and you don't have Mason pointing out what those idols are in your life, if it's just you and the Lord and you're really honest, these are the things I put before him like a lot. And then, you guys, when we get off the fence and when we get honest, you know what we get to see? We get to see the Lord's power in our life in an incredible way. You guys, you can't do this on your own. Some of you, you're trying in your own strength to follow the Lord. You're trying in your own strength and you're like, I just can't do it, Jacqueline. I try, I try, I try, and I fail. You guys, God wants to give you power to stand up for him. He wants to give you power to click the X and not look at what's on the screen. He wants to give you the power to choose the right friends. He wants to give you the power 
to be respectful to your parents. He wants to give you the power to forgive. He wants to give you the power to stand up for him. Elijah was one man. He stood up in God's power against evil King Ahab and against 450 prophets, and he did it because he was being used by God to win back the hearts of the people. You guys, when we fast forward into the New Testament, there is one man that God sends, and he doesn't just die for one group of people, he dies for all of us. He battles for our heart because that is what the Lord does. Tonight, my friends, The Lord wants to give you power to stand up for him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that there are idols in our life, things in our life, Lord, that we can't get rid of on our own. We can't overcome these things on our own. Lord God, we need you. We need you to come, Lord, and give us the power to to even say yes to you and to live for you, Lord. We need you to fill us fresh tonight. God, I pray for for the students in this place, Lord, that what goes viral wouldn't be just this fire moment, but what goes viral in this place tonight is a bunch of students that are saying yes to you and their hearts are being turned back to you. God, we love you. Have your way in this place tonight in Jesus' name.